Welcome all and thanks for watching the first Never Stop Cycling Virtual Recon, a series in which riders will recon a crucial uh, section of an upcoming race and they're going to share their insights with you on it. And they're just doing it at home on their tax trainer. Uh, my name is Rob and I'm your host. And you've probably already recognized the guest next to me on the screen. It's TJ Van Garderen of EF Pro Cycling. Welcome, TJ. Thanks for joining us today. How are you going? Oh, it's going good. Thanks for having me. It, I can see you've already uh, in the warm up. It's getting a bit uh, warm already. Yeah, we uh, we just did the climb before the Col de la Luzette. It was a narrow, not too steep, but uh, narrow, and then the downhill was tricky. It was enough for me to start working up a sweat already. <laughs> Now we're on the Col de la Luzette, which I hear has 17% gradients. It, it, it sure has. So, so you're, go, you're going to be in for a treat on your Wednesday morning. It is uh, Wednesday, the, the, the 5th of August, so a couple of weeks out still from the Tour de France. Uh, you already mentioned the Col de la Luzette, so uh, maybe a good time f to bring that one up on the screen and explain to uh, people a bit more about the Col de la Luzette. So there it is. The Col de la Luzette is going to be featuring in the finale of the Tour de France Stage 6 on the stage from Lette to Mont, to Mont Aigual, I should say. Um, it's about 12 kilometers long, 7% average gradient. And as you can see on the Climb Pro future on your screen of the Garmin Plus future, um, a very steep middle section and towards the end. And uh, that's definitely a part where uh, TJ will be sweating uh, even more probably uh, in a bit time. The top of the climb is uh, around 1360 meters of altitude. And from there, it's still around 14 kilometers to the finish with a short downhill and then an eight kilometer at a more gentle 4% of, uh, of Mont Agual. Maybe a bit of an unknown climb to, uh, to a lot of people, the Col de la Luzette. But yeah, definitely one uh, is gonna bode well for, for a lot of exciting racing. Uh, TJ, had you already uh, heard of the climb uh, before? Uh, no, I, I'd, I'd never heard of this before. First time seeing it. And it's such a good... Uh, you were really enthusiastic about the virtual recon that uh, you already did the climb before as well. So you get that total finale of the, of the stage six. Um, it's going to be a tough one because apparently the myth is that Bernard Hinault had to walk slopes of the Col de la Lizette actually. Have you heard about that one? <laughs> that was a little before my time, but uh, I kind of feel like getting off and walking right now. <laughs> it was you were at a section of uh, let us show the right, the people at home at the, at eight percent right now, so it's still on the lower slopes and it's still going to be uh, more difficult. Uh, but yeah, Bedar, you know, apparently after a big night out in the nineteen eighty uh, in the Colla, uh, sorry, in the Grand Prix Midi Libre, had to get off, had to start walking and uh, later threw in the towel in that race. But uh, yeah, big nights out uh, during racing. Not sure if that's uh, if that's still happening. Uh, is it happening at EF? Definitely not on EF, <laughs> but uh, if, if you're serious about winning, you're not gonna be wanting to do that. Just ask Bernardi no. But I'm not gonna say that nobody does it. Okay, okay. So people are all curious, but maybe uh, maybe we'll hear something about that at, at some point if there's still a bit of partying going on. Sometimes you hear those stories. You never heard it from me. You didn't hear anything from me. <laughs> all right. Well, like I said, the, the Côte d'Alene is uh, It's on the way to the finish on Mount Agual. Mount Agual, really famous uh, for actually featuring in the book The Rider by uh, Tim Crebe, uh, a Dutch writer. It's, a, it's an originally a Dutch novel. You have a little bit of uh, Dutch heritage, TJ. Um, have you read it? I have not read it, but definitely need to brush up on my Dutch, so I'll give it a read. It's, 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 it's there in English as well, but you can try the Dutch version if you want to, but uh, you're probably better off with, uh, with the English one. <laughs> so, um, virtual recon. Usually you probably do all these recons on the bike, uh, somewhere outside. This time you're sitting on a tax trainer. How does, how does it compare and what's the difference? Well, honestly, there's a lot of hassle that comes along with doing recon. Usually, uh, 
do the recon a couple months out from the tour, but they like to resurface a lot of the roads. So a lot of times you're getting rerouted through construction or getting stopped. Also the weather in May can be a bit worse than in July. So you can get rain and just some bad weather, or even some passes that are closed. Um, you know, it's a lot of time in the car, a lot of time in hotel beds. So I must say, being able to do the recon from my living room, it's uh, a lot more comfortable. And you're still uh, working uh, on the on experience, sort of like the heat inside as well, probably. As you can see, a bit of sweat is starting to uh, starting to show up slowly. Yeah, this the gradient's kicking up, so it's it's not uh, like just watching on the screen. You have to work for this recon still. <laughs> so uh, let let us see uh, where you're getting at. Uh, gradient's really kicking up there, thirty percent now. And you're still cruising and talking at, uh, what is it, 330 watts or something, TJ. So uh, it seems like you survived that, uh, that whole pandemic uh, pretty well and you still uh, got your fitness. Wait, say it again? It seems like you still have your fitness after, because you're still uh, comfortably talking at 300 watts, pushing up those gradients. Yeah, definitely, uh, you know, our team did a good job of uh, staying fit during the lockdown. We're missing the racing just like anyone else to get that sharper level of fitness. But um, but no, our, our team here on EF, we, uh, you know, we weren't sleeping while we were in lockdown. We, we were putting in the work. So you, you've spent a fair bit of time back in the U.S. Uh, after you did Colombia and you did Perry Nice. Uh, so how, how was it in the U.S.? Have you been able to, like you said, uh, putting down the work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, doing uh, some good rides around my home in California. The only thing I was missing back in the U.S. was the NBA playoffs. So now I'm having to watch it here, but, you know... Better late than never. So is that uh, like early mornings catching up on the result or is it actually st staying up all night and actually watch some games as well? <laughs> I might have pulled one all night to catch a good game, but uh, no, I got the NBA League Pass, so I just put the game on repeat and just put the hype of scores on. So it's almost like watching it live. And and you're a big uh, you're a big Denver uh, Denver Nuggets fan. What do you reckon about their chances? Yeah. I mean, they need to get Jamal Murray back in the lineup, but uh, you know they had one nasty loss to the Heat. Not too worried about that, but uh, no, I'm, I'm, they're looking good. They also look like they stayed in shape during the lockdown. <laughs> Just like you, TJ. Um, you, you still, you're now on a more a little bit of a of a flat section. Maybe a good chance, uh, maybe to explain to the people still, like what what are you looking for, like in in a recon when you're doing recons? Oh, you just look for all kinds of things. You see, obviously, this is a really narrow road, so positioning is going to be really important. Yeah, right now the slopes are a little less, so. When it, you can use this as a chance to recover for the steeper parts coming up or recover from the steeper parts that you had just done. Um, recovery obviously means you still got to keep going because you don't want to lose position on such a narrow road. Um, it's also nice to see the trees around, giving you some nice shade from the summer heat in July or or September, I guess September is New July. Um, ooh, and now we're now we're headed up again. Eight, nine, seven percent. It, there's supposed to be a stretch somewhere. Um, I think it's sort of like seven so k from the top. Then it starts like a five kilometer section around uh, nine point six percent on average. D did you know that before you signed up for this? <laughs> 
I'm kind of wishing I would have chosen <laughs> stage where it's nice and flat to the finish <laughs> even just the road surface you can see it looks really bumpy and it's like a nasty climb i don't blame bernardino for walking <laughs> great call yes yeah, so it looks really narrow winding and i think you've reached the the steepest part of the climb uh, by now as well um, you're on uh, some steep sections with about 11% now. It doesn't seem to uh, to ease down uh, soon anyway either. Um, I, this is almost a climb where handle the gradient. You have to get out of the saddle here with those 11% uh, uh, gradients. So what would, yeah. what what kind of what kind of cassette would you be thinking about then if you would put like a bigger one on the back? You going to do a thirty Ooh. then or? I don't know. It's uh, maybe a thirty on thirty or thirty two on the back, or you could even go the route of uh, putting a thirty six on the front, small chain ring. Um, that's a question for. Andreas Clear, he's always the tech guy when it comes to equipment, so he'll know what the best option is. So probably after this uh, virtual recall, you can give him a call and say, okay, we've got, we might have an issue for uh, for stage six of the tour this year. Oh, I think we should get Andreas on the Skype chat right now. I think he needs to see what we're doing here. We could do that for the next. For sure, if we got him on, he would know. Okay, 36 on the front, or... You know, we're putting the light screws or bolts in the whatever, or who knows? He'll 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 work something out. Maybe maybe we should get him on uh, for for a next series then, or maybe he can do one of the uh, one of the other class for a virtual recon. See if he's still got his fitness from his uh, pro days. Does he? Oh, you should just get him in a kit and have him ride up a seventeen percent recon. <laughs> he'd be he'd be thrilled. <laughs> So talk about the uh, talk about the Tour de France. I think there's still a uh, still a long list at the moment for, of uh, of riders. Um, what does it the look like a couple of weeks out for you? How sure are you going to be there? Well, I know I'm doing the Dauphiné, and then we're going to a camp in Andorra. Twelve guys on the long list now. We need to have a few riders in reserve. To make sure that we can feel the strong draws for cost. But um, I'm pretty. Chances that I'll. And what do you reckon about about the whole team? Are there any. Uh, do you already think, if you look like a climb like this, if there's going to be a certain rider on your team that it's uh, this is going to favor a climb like this, or is it you? or what are your thoughts when you when you're this has Sergio Haguita written all over it. These steep pitches. Technical, narrow. He can get himself into position. No one's gonna drop him. And I don't see anyone beating him to the line. There we go. So we can write that down for stage six. Sergio Haguita. Higita monster. Yeah, but yeah, maybe we need to keep that a secret. <laughs> I, I might have to cut it out then. Nah, I think with Higita, the secret's out. Everyone knows how good he is. Everyone knows. He'll be good. And it's not a question of if he goes, it's a question of can you stop him? My guess is that answer is no. Yeah, like those, those roads are really good. It could be a problem. Hey, it's so narrow. It, 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 yeah. lo it looks a little bit rough, so unless they put some new smooth tarmac on there, it, uh, it could be a different ride. Does that change a lot, if it would be new fresh tarmac on here? Or? Sometimes if the road is nice and smooth, it's easier to follow in the wheel. The speeds can be a little faster, so a draft. Yeah. It sounds funny getting a draft at 10%, but you, it's there. But when the road surface is rough, 
it makes it harder in the wheel. It makes it a more level playing field. So you're not even getting a draft even when you're sitting in fifth position. So it makes a difference for sure. And is there already like a stage for the for this year's Tour de France that you looked at like that you that you would actually favor or have like a favorite stage for it? If you looked at the route so far or Wow. Um, that time trial on the Planche de Bay Fee is definitely going to be something interesting. Um, let's see, I know in the beginning part I'm really familiar with a lot of roads are there around Nice. Going up to Col de Turini. Used to be one of the favorite training routes of mine. Um, I don't know, it looks like a really hard route. You just gotta take any opportunity that's there. Tight switchbacks. And now the road's opening up, you're getting above the tree line. No more cover, no more shade, you can walk from the wind, from those trees. And probably during the tour. The and it's nine and a half percent. Yeah. Probably during the during the Tour de France, no more time to actually have a look around and enjoy that landscape. What's this? Probably this is the only time that you can sort of like enjoy those views. Because next time it might be a bit, uh, might be a bit high heart rate and a full in racing mode by this stage. Yeah, I don't know. My next is probably just going to be the back of whatever wheel I can cling on to. <laughs> So, so what's the, what's your ambition to going into that Tour de France if you be selected? Is it is it like a is it like a domestic role or maybe go for your own chances like in that only in that time trial or? Um, we have to see what chances present themselves. I mean, the roads, uh, uh, the nature of the course is going to shake up the roads really quickly, given that we have a mountain stage on stage two. So uh, I think it'll be pretty clear what the ambition is right from the start. And then for the rest of the race, I'll do my duties as I'm called upon and just got to show up ready. And where you then look at the, uh, this one, like this stage is quite early on in the race. It's already... Uh, yeah, really, really tough one. When you think about this, it would it then be sort of like a GC battle already here, or do you think it's just going to be a break and maybe all the GC leaders are just saving their energy for for later on in the Tour de France? Or this is certainly not a day where you want to have a bad day. I think um, you know this day almost reminds me of the day that all of Leap broke away last year. But you could definitely lose it. But all Philippe almost won the tour on that day. So uh, I think you have to go in with the mentality of if someone has really good legs on a day like today, they could gain serious time. Let's just quickly let everyone enjoy the view in this corner. I think that the steepest uh, section is uh, about to come up shortly. There's still a oh, you mean we haven't done it already? <laughs> nah, there's still a maximum I slope of 17.7% of coming, TJ. So be prepared for that. Oh, it might man. be the next corner, maybe. Yeah, we're definitely going to need smaller gears for this climb. How hot is it getting in there in Girona, in the living room? How hot is it getting in the living room at the moment? Oh man, I got the fans blowing <laughs> right on me. I got the window open, and I'm still dripping. So I think this could be where that uh, where that steepest section is going to be. Is that something that you look uh, you look at your Garmin um, to have like that Clybro future on and then see those gradients and know what's coming up? Is that something that you guys have on during the race? Yeah, that's super useful. When you're on a steep section, even just to glance down and see like, okay, 
this steep section only lasts for 400 meters. Mentally, it just makes it a lot easier to survive that section. Look forward to the, the shallower section, which I have a little better. And what is what? What are things that you were looking on on your screen besides that, like gradient? It, do you check your heart rate? Have you do you have like the power, your average power in uh, on your screen? What is it that you pay extra attention to? I try to look at uh, my power and my cadence. I try to uh, right now. I'm not doing a good job with my cadence, but <laughs> it's a race. You know, it's you save so much. Fatigue in your muscles if you can keep that cadence a little bit higher. So I'll try to look at the power and make sure that make sure that my cadence probably stays above eighty. Do you find it like on a trainer always a, a little bit harder to uh, to get to that uh, to get that cadence up? I find it ten percent and eleven percent. It's harder to get my cadence up. <laughs> Especially when you don't have that uh, that big cock on the back that you might need. Yeah. So you already mentioned uh, mentioned Hikita. Um, he came onto the scene like last year. When did you notice, like when he joined the team, that this was going to be a, a, a special one? When we raced Tour of California, you could see it. Just. Um, he did everything he was asked to, played the team role, and nearly came away with the win. And that was his first professional race. And your, your thoughts just automatically went to, man, this kid's special. Hey, obviously, he's one of the one of the Colombians uh, on your team. Rigo is there as well. Um, you went to Colombia earlier this year for the, for the second time, fell in love with it uh, last time. How was it this year? Oh, it was amazing. I love it there. Perfect training, great food, great weather, great roads, great people. Amazing place. Can't wait to go back. I'll just let you let you go to it for, for a sec. As you, this is the steepest section, okay? So after this, you'll be... Uh, it's only going to get less. <laughs> All right. Ooh, there it is. 17.7, I saw it. Ooh. That's going to break some legs. Especially because it's pretty later on in the climb. It's not immediately at the start, but it's already after a solid bit of climbing. After that first climb, and then uh, you're getting into the Col de la Luzette. And I think it's about like 8Ks or something into this climb that you're now getting that really steep section. Uh, I'm going to have a talk with the people that made these roads. <laughs> How big is the bus going to be? Uh, like Ruppetto going to be by this stage Whoa. of the climb? It's going to be probably two thirds of the peloton. How do you see it like right now? Because there's been some races going on. Maybe you've watched uh, Strade a bit over over the weekend, as it was the past weekend. Um, does it does it give you some information on what to expect when you start in the Dauphiné in the upcoming weeks? Over Basically, what I learned is that nobody was really lazy during this layoff. Everyone's in great shape. I think a lot of people were expecting some sluggish racing. I didn't see that at all. I saw guys firing on all cylinders, showed up ready to rock and roll, and just goes to show the seriousness of the Peloton. You know, they they didn't use that layoff to uh, be lazy and drink beer. Everyone was out there getting better, and it showed in the racing. I mean, that was. That racing was brutal. And think about talking about brutal. Is it? Are we now by the stage that you can call this climb brutal as well? Absolutely. <laughs> Fifty. Another section here of fifteen percent. 
Get into get into sixteen probably. Is there another climb uh, that comes to mind that you can sort of like compare it with? Ooh. Let me have a think. Similar to something like in the Vosges region. Narrow roads, steep pitches. Um, like, uh, you know the Planche de Béfi? We did a climb before that. It was much similar to this. This almost seems like Pace Basque style. Do you have a certain uh, do you have a certain type of favorite climb? Did you like do you, What's that? Do you have like a certain type of favorite climb? Do you like it more gradual or do you like those steep pitches or what do you prefer? Is there a favorite favorite climb of you in general? If you can keep it under 10% gradient, I'm usually pretty <laughs> good. Anything above that? I'm just trying to hold the wheel. Okay. So, so keep rolling here on this little section again of 15%. As people can see at home, this is just an absolute brutal climb. And something that really shows, I think, as well, is there's so many corners. You just keep twisting and turning on these narrow roads. Yeah, and that's... Uh, if you start drifting back into 30th position, those corners can be even more brutal. You get that accordion effect. The guy in the first wheel just accelerates a little bit out of the corner. By 30th position, you're sprinting. By 40th position, you're dropped. So how hard is it then in a recon like this to actually pick some landmarks, to actually recognize it with all those corners? Because they, at some point, they must all look alike almost, or not? Well... I think you have to look for major things, not like a little landmark. But now I'm noticing more trees. Before, I noticed uh, there were no trees around and you could see for a long distance. So those are kind of fun. Because if you think, oh, that rock, there's going to be spectators and things around. You're never going to see that rock there. You have to look for more big picture things. When the road gets wider or when the road narrows, when there's forest cover, or when it's bare, or, uh, or even just gradients, you know, when the gradient kicks up. You're just coming off an altitude camp, I think, in, uh, in Andorra with the team to prepare. Uh, how much of the guys did you think, like, looked already ready to, to get into it this season and get some of those big results? I, uh... I was shocked at the level of all my teammates. They were they were chiseled, and even Mike Woods was dropping us on the climbs, and he'd come back from a broken leg. I mean, super impressive. Like everyone, everyone took their job seriously. Would uh, would Mike uh, love all these uh, gradients on this climb? He's another one to look out for. He might go. We might have two uh, tactics to play for this stage. And also, so like on the on the camp that you guys just did, you had some uh, you had some massive days of some massive weeks. I must say as well. I think uh, close to like thirty hour weeks on the bike. Um, yeah. Was that like sort of? Nate Wilson was up there supporting us, and man, he was. Uh, he was driving us hard. Was that sort of like still like an incentive or like, or like a stimulus that you that you needed to get ready to get back racing again? Absolutely. I mean, you can train hard by your by yourself, but when you get those uh, that competitive nature going with the teammates, it just adds a different level to it that it's hard to simulate when you're on your own. So how is that competitive nature then? Yeah, guys have some, some little 
time trial efforts uphill or some little races uh, between you guys or yeah we would do a tt effort 15k tt and we all just raced each other or we'd get to the base of the climb and they'd say okay get to the top first all sorts of stuff like that just to you know we'd roll pace lines sprint each other to town signs just all that competitive stuff that it's hard to replicate. And who were the winners of those little competitions? Is it, or is that inside information? Uh, well, Danny Martinez. Oh, wow. Wood was, uh, he was smoking us all on the climbs. Sprint. He can sort of like do it all, hey. He started sort of almost as a sprint, sprinter, classics rider, and now he's going up those hills like he's never done anything else. It's true. He is a... He's one of those guys who can do just about everything. And you mentioned... Uh, Martinez, obviously, also an, uh, another South American. So those South Americans, they use their time at altitude pretty well as well during that lockdown. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're going to be they're going to be coming out swinging. In the meantime, you're getting sort of like close to uh, close to the top. It's only what do we see? 1.3 miles. So that's about 2K to go. Ooh, two more K. It's, I must say, it's going to be a little more flat in a bit. You can see it on that uh, on the screen when it's got uh, the next 300 meters sort of like showing. What well, I'm saying that while well, you're just pushing up a 13% gradient. <laughs> <laughs> so having having ridden this one now as a, as a recall, what what's that main takeaway that you take away from this? Figure in any good position into the base, a bigger cassette so that we can spin the cadence, and it's going to hurt like hell. And is it now sort of uh, sort of praying for that the weather is not going to be too hot either? As you mentioned, like there's a bit of tree covering every now and then, but also got like those open open sections where it's going to be boiling if the sun is out. Uh, it's, I mean, the heat can definitely play a huge factor. It can make it a little cooler, that would only help me. But yeah, you, I do notice there's a lot of shady section with these trees that you can see right here. One small little relief for such a brutal climb. Talk, talking about a bit of a, of a relief. A little bit downhill for you uh, just before we hit the, the final bit of a punch in that last uh, couple of hundred meters before you reach uh, the top of the Col de la Luzette. So is this something uh, that you consider uh, would consider like doing more often doing like the virtual recons after having done this one? Oh, sure. I think it's huge. I'm going to try to recon as much as I can from this. This is a uh there's a lot you can take away from this and learn and uh, do it from the comfort of your living room. Comfort <laughs> of living room. I was about to say that comfort level must uh, must be a bit uh, at another level now than it was at the start. <laughs> <laughs> So these are the final section. Do you think if there's still like a little punch coming on a bit later on, just before that top, if it's still together, is it an after climb like this possible to still make a little punch over the top? Try to get a little bit of advantage to before you get on the Mont Aigual for that descent, or would you say if it's together here now, probably gonna probably gonna stay together? It's. <coughs> the 
talk here, it's more just jockeying for position on the descent, which I'll, from my guess, from looking at these roads, is going to be really important to get a good position on that descent. But um, as far as attacking, might be a little early with that uh, finishing climb still to come. But um, I don't think the roads are good. I don't think the group is going to be too big coming into this section. And, and knowing that that final climb then is about like eight kilometers at a more, uh, yeah, comfort level. So maybe on the comfort level, but at least like 4% uh, average or no really steep sections anymore. If someone gets away here, does it make it easier to stay away on that 4% sections? Or is it actually harder for the best climb to stay away on sort of like gradients of 4%? It also depends on how organized the teams are. If a team is there with four riders left, they can get to the front and chase them back. If all the way, someone gets away, some tired legs and hesitation, And when you when you approach a descent, is it then something that you for your uh, that you might get like your Garmin on the navigation route and then actually use it to sort of like know the course and see what's coming up in conditions? Do so you kind of yeah. get a feel? That's huge to know uh, if there's a sharp corner coming up or if it's a corner that you can take at speed. Actually, it just makes it a lot safer because if you're trying to Fly your way back and you're taking a little bit of risk or stay off the front taking a little bit of risk you know how hard you can push it and when it's like okay this is a dangerous corner you must be getting a, a little bit of a relief now like i said that final little bit push coming up i think it's in the final 300 meters before the top of this climb it's just one more little push up. The cadence is up now, uh, TJ. <laughs> What's that? Your cadence is up now, so that's looking good now. Got it. You got through that 80. Yeah. <laughs> Try to keep it up. So are the fans going to be uh, excited watching uh, watching this climb? You reckon? Um. I hope so. I mean, the fans are part of the tour. Obviously, I want everyone to be safe and keep social distance, wear masks. Hopefully, there will be some people to cheer us on. Are you, are you a bit worried about that at this moment, or about like the safety uh, safety aspect of the race? Uh, I mean. I'm a lot less worried now that I've seen what the protocols for the races are, getting all the riders tested, making sure everything is, uh, ooh, it's off of the climb. I think they've, uh, the UCI and the teams have put in some really good protocols to help ensure rider safety. Yeah. Ooh, this looks like a nasty descent. Look at that. Oh, narrow. Sharp corners, 11% gradient downhill. Wow, this is positioning on this descent is going to be huge. I mean, that's the thing. You talk about safety in terms of COVID-19. Look at what we race on. On wheels that big. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Kind of puts it into perspective. Obviously, we need to take on and mess around with our health. But I mean, at the time, if you start thinking about that, you're going to lose track of what's the road in front of you. And that's, uh, you know, that's not to belittle the COVID-19 at all. I want to keep the fans safe. I want to keep the riders safe. I want to keep everybody safe. But I feel like we have protocols in place to do just that. So hopefully... Hopefully the race uh, goes 
starts without a hitch and makes it all the way to Paris, and we can crown a tour, a well-deserving tour champion. All right. I'd say that's a, that are great words to uh, to leave you uh, to it with uh, today, cool. TJ. <laughs> a sigh, a big uh, sigh of relief there. Thanks heaps for uh, thanks heaps for all the time to that you made to uh, yeah to get through this recon. Hopefully it was uh, worthwhile for yeah. you as well. It gave us a lot of insights, and hearing your insights was pretty special. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Anytime. Yeah, we should uh, we should do this again because I'm gonna be. I'm going to try to do some more recon for this tour because take a lot away from it. Cool. Well, we're all, we're all up for it. And uh, the software, the text software is there. The Garmin is there with the Climb Pro feature. So that's definitely going to be uh, going to be a success, I reckon. And we could uh, put Andreas Clear on there. Yeah, let's do it. That's a good all idea. Right. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in for this uh, virtual recon. Never stop cycling. And uh, see you guys next time. Ciao.